Hello everybody. It's a cloudy morning in Ailao Mountain in the center of Yunnan. And this morning, uh, after a quick walk through the forest, we are uh, walking towards Mr. Huang's Oolong tea plantations. Um, today I'm gonna do a brief presentation of those plantations. So let's go, have a look. So, as we are closing into the plantations, I'd like to first uh, have a few words about the, the environment. So you can see that the plantation is there and it's located on a heavy slope. Uh, so the area is like one huge mountain and it's a mountain range actually made of, uh, uh, of several smaller hills and so uh, like, like one of these hills um, like the T you can see is on a small hill and you have a small valley here and there is a marsh actually in the in that small valley so if you want to walk through it your feet will get very wet um, so this explains the lack of forest here and it's interesting because most of the area is forested but um, in those small valleys between two hills we can uh, have a kind of like a marsh like it is here and um, if you look at the, the forest, so we can look at the forest here, for example. Mm, it's interesting because it, it almost reminds me of some parts of my hometown. Um, the forest is covered in, in moss. Uh, you can see the moss on the soil and also a lot of moss growing on the tree. Um, these forests are very old uh, because uh, they are part of that national, national park park and apparently uh, well I think you can consider them primary forest they, they might be uh, over a thousand years old and uh, so basically a, you consider a primary forest when the oldest um, the oldest individuals in uh, in the ecosystem have uh, completed one life cycle so because some species, for example, they, they will only grow after one of the big tree dies and falls on the floor. And so, well, usually we consider 1,000 year, but it will depend on the ecosystem. So I'm not, I'm not sure if it's primary or not, but it definitely looks, um, looks more complex in terms of ecosystem than the average forest you would see uh, in Sichuang Bana or in lower areas of poor, in less uh, less preserved areas, because you get all that moss on the branches and a lot of parasitic plants. Um, I think one characteristic of those old forests is that um, the parasitic plants rule the, the ecosystem actually in terms of getting the resources. So they are parasitic and all the, the trees work to feed those parasitic plants and they tend to hang from the trees. We're at 2,500 meters of altitude and um, well it means that uh, the plants that grow here are, are different from uh, what we usually find in the tea mountains because most of the tea mountains uh, down south of, are more at 1,400, 600, uh, like Lao Banzang is 1,800 but yeah, 2,500, it's really high and it means that we generally have a different landscape. Now what we can feel in the air, and maybe we can walk towards the, the plantation at the same time, what we can feel in the air is, is it's very wet. And it makes sense because we have the, these old forests which are totally covered in moss um, and they act like a big sponge actually when, uh, when it rains. And these forests are very good at retaining mo moisture, capturing the rain, and then releasing it uh, progressively through evapotranspiration. And so this has an influence actually on the uh, on tea growth. So the thing is, these uh, tea gardens are particularly wet, and we're going to see 
um, what that higher humidity um, entices for the the management of this garden. So let's let's climb up there and uh, we'll talk more about this. Okay, so we're up here. I'm going to start uh, this review of the garden by a soil inspection. So let's take a random piece of soil around here. Oh, I'm digging for a lot of organic matter. Okay, so this is the topsoil. So you can see that it's very rich in organic matter. You can see the dead leaves, the, the roots, so you have that litter. And of course, if we smell, yeah, it smells really good. You get that uh, fermentation smell of all the microorganisms working. So now if I touch the soil, well, from what I got here, it's very sandy. It, it seems like it's pure sand, uh, coupled with organic matter. Mm, it's also, I guess, that having a high amount of organic matter, it will bind uh, the few clay that we have, and, and you have a, a clay organic matter complex, that's called, and that's what gives you that great uh, nutrient and water retention ability. Maybe uh, I just want to, let me just check somewhere else. Uh, because it's interesting because I found more clay in other places. Yeah, but here it's definitely sand. You can see that it doesn't really stick. If you, if you have a lot of clay, it will feel like those skincare products or you can layer it very thinly on the skin. Uh, there is a little bit of it but uh, not too much. So that's interesting, but something I noticed while uh, walking here is that, uh, well, it's, I still don't understand the, the soil structure, the general structure. It seems that mm, the soils are very heterogeneous here. Uh, you can have one, one patch which is very red and one which is white and another one which will be a more, um, a more bluish color and so that that would indicate different soils and uh, so all I can say here is that the soils seem seem heterogeneous uh, but what's sure is that everywhere we get a lot of organic matter and at least on the top soil you have a, a thick layer of organic matter now well at least from what we can get from here is that at least in this garden, the soil seems to be draining well. Uh, so when it rains, mm, the water goes quickly uh, through, the, through the soil. It percolates through the soil and it will uh, end up in that marsh down there. Um, now let's go one stage uh, above. And you can see that uh, we're in uh, mid-June now and the rainy season has already started and it's starting to rain here by the way um, we have some medium sized uh, weeds that are growing so uh, it's normal as soon as the rainy season starts all the seeds in the in the ground will open up will sprout and you get that weed but something interesting here is that if you look there if you look inside the tea garden, below the bushes, you don't have that many weeds there. And it's thanks to the thick cover that um, the tea trees form with their leaves. And this is, in this is, intended, this is intended by the tea farmer uh, who actually prunes, prunes the, tea, the tea trees in that way um, so as to have a thick crown a thick and a wide crown but you can see that uh, there aren't that many leaves at least if you look at the tea trees inside there aren't that many leaves um, below below the the canopy you could say below the main crown and so it's good because every leaf needs to do respiration so if you have lots of leaves but a lot of them do not uh, cannot reach sunlight, do not do photosynthesis, well, you're, you're wasting energy. So what you, what you want to achieve, preferably, 
if you're pruning your tea trees, like it's the case here, you want to have a thick layer of leaves at the top and make sure that, um, that all the leaves will reach the sunlight at some point and also that all the, the sunlight is, um, well, that most of the sunlight is captured by the leaves. So if you look at the, the tea tree from above, you can think how many layers of leaf on average uh, are there in my tree. And this is called the leaf index. And uh, depending on the leaf index and the, the species, you'll get a percentage of, um, of uh, sunlight that will be captured by the leaves. But anyway, this is maybe unnecessary details actually. What I wanted to show you is that the way you prune the tea tree, it can help, so it can help for weed, um, weed management because it avoids, uh, it prevents the weeds uh, below the tea trees from gro growing. And by, uh, these weeds would be the ones that would suck up most energy. So they're gonna, they're gonna clear the weed um, probably in a, in a couple of weeks um, so as not to allow them to grow too fast too tall and that work is facilitated because basically more than half of the garden is not covered in weed actually all the areas below the tea trees are not covered in weed now the second advantage of this pruning technique well you can see if you look at how the the garden is designed the tea picker is here and so you, you will have two tea pickers per row, actually. So this is one row. One pit tea picker will be here and will be picking tea here. While the second one will be picking tea like this. The second one will be picking tea like this. And so the, the two pickers move, <laughs> the two pickers move through, uh, through the garden and pick uh, the tea together. And so this is very smart because it allows you to have, uh, well, it allows you to, to, to waste less uh, empty room um, with the roads. You have less roads in the tea gardens than, uh, than in a common tea garden. Uh, I guess you probably, you, you probably uh, earn like 20, 25% of, uh, uh, of planted surface thanks to this so you will have a higher yield per hectare just because you are smart while designing the garden so this is a nice perk of uh, this garden now I would like to bring your attention to this plant for example what is this so this is some kind of uh, parasitic plants it looks like like some you know, some monocots because the the, the leaf veins are parallel, so it could be something like wild rice or, or bamboo or something like that. And um, yeah, they grow, they grow through the tree and uh, they usually use the energy of the tree um, to grow. So it's bad, for the, it's bad for the physiology and for the yield of the tea tree. And while walking through this tea garden, we can see a lot of parasitic plants. Um, and Mr. Huang says this is due to the, um, to the high humidity in this garden. So this is a problem. Usually you, you can only just take them out by hand, just like this. So you hire workers just like picking tea. Um, and, and that's... Uh, that's enough. Like in, in a conventional tea gardens, uh, there are pesticides that can be used to, to uh, prevent the parasitic plants. But here it's an organic tea garden. They have the certification. So they don't have access to uh, uh, these techniques. Now you'll probably also have uh, problems with uh, disease. Usually uh, all what's uh, fungi and bacteria, they, they thrive in... Um, in wet environments. Mm, I don't see much indication of uh, disease here, uh, but probably th there are some at some parts in the year. Now, oolong tea gardens are pruned twice a year. This is a requirement uh, for oolong tea. That's how you get that um, uniform growth. 
So they, they are harvested twice a year. And after the har well, just before the harvest, actually, you prune them, okay? And since you've pruned them, um, all the sprout, all the the buds will sprout at the same time. So you only have one, uh, one very abundant harvest uh, at every season. So once in spring and once in winter. So um, actually, you could say that now that we're after the harvest, we don't really care that much about uh, some short-term damage that could be done to the tea trees because anyway the the bushes are going to be are going to be pruned um probably in a couple of weeks okay so usually when you don't have access to um to fungicide um, pruning is the only uh, technique that you can use to to treat any disease problem you just kill everything and um the fact that there's no leaves it will make the the garden a bit drier and all these uh all this fungi, the, the stuff will uh, will die out. What you can see, um, what you can see here, if I if I take a couple of leaves, I can see traces of uh, what herbivory, like uh, insects, uh, pest eating the leaves. So maybe I can stay a bit closer. And if you look at the leaves here, you can see that um, they've been. Uh, punctured so these this leaf has both been punctured in the middle uh, by some insects so these punctures they trigger some oxidation and that will allow you to do um, oriental to make oriental beauty that uh, that early oxidation caused by insects gives uh, gives you a very specific uh, muscatel fragrance like they call it in Darjeeling but you can see also on this leaf that the sides have been uh, eaten. The sides have been eaten probably by a different kind of insect. Um, these are fairly mature leaves, so they didn't get that much damage. Maybe I, I can try to show you um, some more, uh, some younger leaves. Maybe we can go up there. Let's go, let's have a look. So you can see that these mature leaves, they, they are very uh, hard to the touch and they are not damaged by, uh, by the pest. It's because generally those pests prefer the slightly tender leaves. Um, I don't see... Oh, I can see here some tender leaves. Yeah, you can see that these leaves are a bit tender and again they've been damaged so you can imagine that for a small leaf it's a lot of damage look at these lots of punctures unfortunately uh, there are not enough insects this year to make it worth it uh, making oriental beauty so this year mr huang couldn't make oriental beauty um, but that's how it is Oriental beauty is more of an opportunistic tea than uh, something you can be sure to make every year. Oh, now in terms of fertilization, uh, one big difference that you can find here with most uh, oolong tea grown in Taiwan is that it's only fertilized with uh, organic fertilizer as opposed to mineral fertilizer. So organic fertilizer is uh, most of the time compost or uh, some kind of manure or it can be, um, it can be a mulch. Mm. So this is mainly mostly organic matter with a little bit of nutrients in it. Uh, nutrients that just are embedded in the organic matter and as the organic matter degrades, the nutrients are released. So it's more like a slow, um, you have a slow release of nutrients. We consider often that it happens over three years, the release of nutrients. Um, and, uh, and they are not huge in number, the, the nutrients. While most of the time, if you want heavy fertilization, if you want to bring a lot of nutrients quickly, you will use uh, mineral fertilizers, uh, among which mo most of them nowadays are chemical fertilizers. So it means like, uh, well, fertilizers that we, we mine 
and also for the nitrogen that we capture uh, from the air and that we insert into some matrix matrices a matrix just like a pill for a medicine you put it in the soil and it will degrade uh, well depending on the matrix it will degrade immediately or over several months or even years uh, but since we're in organic agriculture um, the the use of chemical fertilizer is not available to the farmer okay so mr huang will only only use organic fertilizer and i think he doesn't use any kind of uh, of um, like organic certified like non-chemical mineral fertilizer that would be a possibility but they are more rare nowadays so like mineral fertilizer it could be for example uh, ground ground bones uh, if you grind the bones you have a pretty high amount of nutrients in them so you can release that and it's more like like mineral mm. but I think he doesn't do it here so there's a fairly low amount of fertilization um, here a fairly low amount of nutrients in the garden and I think that's what makes the teas so different from uh, the wulong teas you can typically have in Taiwan um, I find the teas here usually to be more long brewing but maybe less fancy, less impressive in the first couple of brews and I find them to be just a, a bit like poor tea in the way that uh, they are really good teas for the mouthfeel they are teas that make you feel good like sometimes with Taiwanese teas I, I can have more than two or three oolong, uh, Taiwanese oolong teas in a row because I, I get very quickly tea drunk and with Mr. Huang's tea, I found out that uh, I can spend the whole day actually drinking his teas and um, they will be less uh, mind-blowing mm, when you smell in the cup or in the first brews. But overall, I would say that I would rate the session mm, very high if you look at the whole session. Mm. So, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure this is very related to uh, the way the fertilization is done. The, the lack of uh, heavy fertilization here. Now also, you can see that all around here, it's totally surrounded by forest. This forest helps a lot. Mm. If you listen out there, you can hear a lot of birds. And these birds will also help control the pest. So I guess uh, you can't have Mm, really big uh, herbivores like bigger insects that would totally destroy your garden here because the the birds would hunt them down and uh, well it's not that easy to have birds actually in in some environments which are heavily disturbed uh, the birds tend to be the the first uh, the first kind of animals who get extinct extinct or who take a heavy hit when there's uh, environmental degradation and so here we can take advantage of the protection mm, as a national park here we can take advantage of uh, this biodiversity it definitely helps I think in terms of uh, pest management last thing that I want to mention is in this garden you can look at the biodiversity inside the garden and you will find that here there's not a heavy shading uh, not like in the Jingmai natural tea gardens, for example, or not like in a, in a Gushu, an, the ancient tea forest that you'd find in Sichuan Bana or Mongku. Um, and actually, I've never seen shade trees in, uh, in a Wulong tea plantation. Mm? Because let me remind you but that here we're using the Sinensis variet varietal, the small leaf varietal. Uh, well, for poor tea, it's a Samica. Um, and they have quite different um, things usually um, Asamika is maybe um, uh, less uh, sensitive to shade related to yield um, it's also more resistant to pest and everything uh, I don't want to talk too much about these differences but what sure is uh, I've never seen a shaded uh, oolong, oolong tea plantation but here you can see that Mr. Huang uh, planted or left a couple of trees in the garden while it was established and you can see that these are uh, very different species 
of trees. I haven't talked with him about um, the interest of each uh, species, but you can think of different tactics. So uh, a single tree or just a couple of trees uh, packed together in the garden can be a haven for, uh, for some natural predators, for example, who will go in the surrounding um, tea trees hunt and will go back in their home, which is the, the tree in the middle of the garden. Some trees can have uh, repelling properties for some in insects. On the other hand, some trees uh, can be attractive to, um, to some insects. So another technique you could use is what we call the push-pull technique. Uh, let's say you have a pest, um, you have a specific pest you want to, to get rid of. You plant trees that the, the pest doesn't like in your garden and you plant trees that the, the pest likes on the sides of your gardens. So, he, so the pest will be pushed away from your garden and pulled towards the, the hedgerows of your garden. That's one possibility. Um, but here I guess he chose to, to have a mix, yeah, a mix of uh, different plants, probably with, um, with interesting properties. This is a, a side I haven't discussed with him. Um, so here the, the purpose of the trees is not shade, but you can keep a small amount of trees to provide other uh, ecosystem services. As now, now we can see it's going to rain hard, so I think we can make our way back to the tea factory. Uh, we're going to walk along that path, and the tea factory is just behind that hill. So we're going to go. Thanks for watching, and see you later. Bye-bye.